sir, this this isn't in your direct realm, but you mentioned it is the uh, the development of capabilities in the information domain. Uh, we in the Canadian military have done it at, on an ad hoc basis over the years. Uh, we started in Afghanistan. We saw it had a great momentum. Then it sort of it, it fell back. How do you see us developing the capabilities within the Canadian Armed Forces and within Canada to uh, to address the challenges in the information domain? One of the challenges we have is that uh, there's not a very good consensus on what uh, the information domain is and where the boundaries are. Um, some see information as just being, uh, you know, that cyber is the essential component of the information domain and uh, if you're doing cyber, you're doing information operations and that's uh, not how I see it. Um, you know, my view is information operations are primarily led outside of the department uh, by the government um, uh, and defending your information space isn't just about defending your networks, it's about to be being able to defend your message. It's about understanding that if they're attacking on an asymmetric basis, you don't attack in kind, you, you respond to disinformation with information, you keep that pure. But then you have to recognize um, the weakness of your adversary and be prepared to um, maneuver through the information domain to point out um, you know, some of those uh, elements. So when I talk about um, um, you know, forced development uh, of information operations, um, it's more than just what we were doing in Afghanistan, so much more. Um, and uh, it, we are a long ways from coming to terms with that. We're a long ways with understanding that with our other government departments all the way up. What's interesting though is that as I've had a couple of gatherings with um, senior leaders from other departments, we all recognize the problem. We all know we need to do something. So, you know, and that might sound um, okay, I know, kind of obvious, but it isn't always the case. And so when you start with at least a recognition that you've got a challenge and a problem, um, we need to understand that our that our machinery in our government works very slowly. It doesn't all Western societies. And so engaging in that conversation um, is um, paramount. One of the challenges that we have is being able to use, uh, and where this is where academia, journalists, other members of society come into play, is that we can intimidate elements of society when we talk about it in overt military terms. So we got to demilitarize our conversation in ways that everybody understands it. Goes to the heart of a, a little piece, and I'll, I'll come right back around on force development, but it, it goes to the heart of uh, the, the piece on cyber a couple of years ago when somebody said, what do we need to do? And I said, the first thing we need to do is to speak English. Ou français, un des deux langues officielles. Because when we were talking about cyber, we were talking about it in a way that black boxed it as a, you know, as a black art. And we, we could never break open. Um, it's difficult enough for military professionals to understand and other uh, professionals uh, within the government construct, let alone our senior civil leaders and across Canadian society. So the challenge you know, here on deterrence is if we can't develop the language in a way that the average Canadian understands it, then we're, we're failing there. And we're not doing justice to the, to the problem. As we look at force development, um, we have to understand how we would apply it first. And I see it being applied through targeting. And the moment I use that term, targeting, people think, oh, you know, you're, you're dropping kinetic. And I remember talking to a, um, a non-accountable official, a uh, term for, you know, a, a ministerial appointment, and I said, you do do targeting all the time. I mean, that's the essence of politics. You go after a vote. You know, you say, I'm not going to spend my time focusing on that neighborhood because uh, they're just not going to vote for us, but these folks over here, well, that's targeting. Um, all it is is the identification. Um, and, you know, by, by us being able to use the targeting process um, that we are developing uh, would enable us to spin out um, the informational elements. And, you know, and it was in its first instance uh, um, the domain of accountable officials, of our ministers, of the prime minister, and of, uh, of, of our senior ele elected officials. But as we begin to look at it within the military, we've got to have the hard conversation about what that actually looks like going forward. Do you leave it as a technology-based when it is a fundamentally, you know, it, I think deterrence is fundamentally uh, a perception based on power. Um, and there are components of it, as rightly pointed out in articles, it comes down to capability and intent. But it's an understanding that um, I may be, you know, five foot and you may be six foot eight, but I'm going to win if it comes to this fight. I mean, that's fundamentally the, the proposition. And so as we begin to develop our capability, um, we 
um, are going to have a hard time, um, but we're going to have to work through it on how all the various elements fit into this in the first order. But I go back to the piece, um, if we do not understand what the limitations are, if we think that information operations is propaganda, then we are hurting ourselves. All right, if we can't get past that, we're, we're doomed, right? In other words, doomed in a, in a sense that we're going to continue to see the same thing played over and over again, and for us to expect a different result is just um, Einsteinian uh, in, in quality. Um, of his definition of insanity. And uh, so there's an element there. So we've got to come to terms with what the adversaries are doing, what it is we're trying to, uh, to defend. Then we will think about the appropriate organizations and structures. We can't launch into the structures, etc. But for the Army folk, it's way more than Simic and PSYOPs. That's just a tiny piece. It's way more than what the Navy does in electronic warfare. It's way more than any one service does within the military. And in fact, the military piece of this is very minor. But nobody... Um, in our society has the ability, the organizational and planning skills that we do. And so we can be a part of any solution with the appropriate oversight and governance um, as we go forward. I've evaded some of the specifics on that because I didn't want the specifics. To me, we, we haven't even come to terms with the first principles on this. My past job before this was Chief Force Development, and we began to discuss this as to where we would go over time, and we realized that um, we really need to have um, the kind of power that you bring um, that, you know, Queens and U.S. Army War College and NATO Defense College are going to bring to the table uh, with other parts of society to begin to understand the space that we're in. Um, and uh, that's in the first order. Thanks. My question is about just our uh, operation in Latvia, because it's been about a year, right? So I was wondering if you could take stock of the last year in terms of the Canadian Armed Forces contribution there both vis-a-vis -vis the other armed forces within the battle group, vis-a-vis -vis maybe the other framework nations within the uh, enhanced foreign presence construct, and of the, maybe the deterrent effect of these various battle groups uh, in this regional context with Russia. Um, when, when I took command in 2015, um, you know, I listened to the dialogue about what NATO was going to do, and, um, and I must say I was a little pessimistic. And now in 2018, as I look back, I'm much more optimistic. I've been impressed by, um, ironically, in some ways, uh, you know, we've had experienced a number of years of, of NATO having become a very slow organization and, and uh, not adapting to need very quickly. Um, but when I look back at what we have achieved, um, it's been uh, fairly impressive. And um, because at, fundamentally it is about reassurance. I mean, I watched the very first major exercise that we were involved in, exercise Trident Juncture for us, it was called Joint X. Um, and uh, we deployed a significant chunk of the Canadian forces that wasn't involved in operations into the exercise scenario. And then I watched as NATO commanders were using this as an example of deterrence towards um, adversaries in, in multiple directions, uh, ironically. Um, and I realized the power of those engagement, the power um, of bringing the nations together and what that meant. As we stood up the mission in Latvia, um, you know, this isn't about a battle group um, that is going to be cohesive and have all elements necessary to fight in a way that was even reflective of, uh, of our posture in the Cold War. That's not the point. In the first instance, it was a demonstration of national and international resolve um, by putting um, our men and women in harm's way, so to say, but into a country to say that, you know, we're standing with you. And I would say that the manner in which the Latvians and the nations of the Baltic in particular, and that's where my, my, I'm more aware of, um, the manner in which they have embraced that um, is quite impressive. It's also uh, been, uh, and I won't go too far on this, but it's also been very impressive to take note of Russia's reactions where uh, we thought they would react and didn't, and where they have reacted um, that we didn't necessarily think that they would, uh, and we're still working that through. Um, it's very clear um, that, to me, that they did not expect the speed at which we would demonstrate resolve, um, that the ability to bring together. We have an eight-nation battle group there um, um, that um, it's not necessarily about the cohesion going out the door. It's in continuous training cycle. But the fact that you have eight nations, and our first battle group commander did an incredible job developing SOPs, bringing eight nations, standard operating procedures, and bringing eight nations onto the same sheet of paper, that they would work the same way, that they, and they brought them all together. Um, that, in its first instance, was impressive.
We also need to take stock that, you know, uh, whether or not we could have a debate today, or many have had, whether the threat was really a conventional threat coming across the border or whether it was something different. And to me, uh, the military professionals in here need to look at how Russia is postured. Um, how it has conducted operations to determine the likely approaches that it would take in an escalation of conflict. The idea that they would bolt out of the blue, not so credible. The idea that it could escalate as a result of something else happening around the world, much more credible. Um, and then in that context, you need to take a look at how they would operate in that space. And without giving away all of that, I would say that we've offered the Latvians in particular something that they value immensely. And, um, and, and so the next piece, though, is to take it beyond a land-centric approach uh, and work it through the joint domain and take stock of how Russia is operating through the domains uh, that don't apply to air, land, and sea, um, and how that factors into play into the Baltic region. And I think that is where NATO's next challenge is going to be. A lot of movement, you know, if we had talked about uh, 2015, that NATO would do the things that it is saying it's going to do as it's leading up to the NATO summit, I would think we'd, we'd probably been calling out the bluff on that one. I don't think so. We'd have been a little pessimistic. So there are reasons for some level of, uh, of optimism. Um, NATO, you know, the challenges that we say about NATO has difficulty doing this and NATO has difficulty doing that. Well, 30 years ago, uh, it wasn't that much better. So, um, you know, at the end of the day, we just need to be a little bit realistic, but continue to apply the pressure moving forward. Um, there's no doubt that certain partners uh, within that construct are doing more than others, um, and um, that's to be expected. That's not new. Um, but um, the demonstration of resolve um, is one, um, and the willingness of the Baltic nations as a result to defend themselves. There are some things that those nations have done that we don't talk about because our focus has been on the battle group, but that they have done that actually concerns um, their adversary, and uh, well done to them. Uh, so they've done their estimate properly because they've looked at how uh, Russia would operate in a, in a time of conflict. So I, I, I'm quite optimistic on this. Uh, I'm not the public face for the mission, you know, we, uh, as we, we go over there, but we're looking at the real-time operational posture and what it means. Um, it was a significant step. Now, can we rest on our laurels um, and take a step back and say, that's it, we're done? No, uh, that's not the case at all because uh, Russia has responded. This is a chess game and uh, in, uh, in their eyes, and, and it's a multidimensional chess game. And so we need to take stock of that and, uh, and, and carry on um, with um, NATO's uh, assurance measures in ways that uh, reinforce deterrence across the spectrum. You made an interesting uh, first principle observation that Canada, while it is a, uh, based on rule of law, is really a values-based nation. Uh, and as you're uh, doing that step back and reflecting, um, are those values fundamentally changing and thereby under, undermining the, our perception of national interests and, and uh, the assumptions that our policies and strategy are based on? or? Or is it just something that we have to revisit and rebrand ourselves uh, to make those policies and strategies uh, vibrant again? You know, any nation that doesn't reevaluate its, um, its assumptions on an ongoing basis is going to be destined for failure. It's something that has to occur. And when I talk about the uh, a nation of values, I see values as changing through time. I see them, there's consistent, there's constants as part of that process. But if I just think back, my time is, uh, you know, if I think back to society in the 60s and 70s, when I, 70s in school, when I became aware what our value sets were uh, back in those days in, in parts of Canada, and, uh, you know, we, we've definitely changed. And my point on this one is um, sometimes when we label ourselves um, uh, a nation of laws, we become too restrictive in understanding of what we need to do. When we turn to lawyers and say, um, you know, can I do that? Um, we perhaps need to be taking a step back to say, I'm not sure I can, but I want you to write me the law that enables me to do that based on the values that I see coming from Canadian society. And that's a very high level. That's not a military proposition. That's a very high civil uh, proposition. I'll give you an, an example of how international law needs to be modified. I can tell um, that um, certain malign actors are putting ships in the water um, carrying contraband that are actually um, uh, coming out of shipyards controlled by the security services of that country. 
that's a problem. We recognize the problem. We need laws to deal with it. I need to be able to have uh, the authorities necessary so, you know, the future commanders of, uh, of coalitions out there can address the problem, knowing that um, it's not just about the dollar value of a kilo of cocaine that, uh, or heroin um, on the street. It's about the second, third, and fourth order cost to our societies. And when we think about those terms, then we come to say, your behavior is unacceptable, um, and therefore, a legal defense construct means that we need to be able to take the following action to mitigate your threat, or at least have you understand that our posture is such that we effectively deter you from doing that. That's one example. So I do see values changing. Um, I just think about the civil values in Canada, um, you know, I, I, in my time as an adult, they have changed, and that's undeniable. Um, and, um, and it will ever change, but I do see some constants that are part of that. And if you continuously uh, uh, come back on that as a cycle, um, I see it as a strengthening process, and that will produce the new laws that are necessary to defend oneself with all of the appropriate oversight. Thank you. Sir, uh Go back to your first precept on setting an effective deterrence strategy about knowing ourselves. And I wonder if you could give us a quick vignette. Pick an us, whether that's Canada, whether that's NATO, whether that's the West. Pick an adversary, whether that be a state or an organization. Um, and how would they view us um, with their own context? How would they view us as our strengths and weaknesses? So just, just look at... Um Actually, I have a couple, but I'm struggling now. There are a couple of them I wouldn't want to uh, throw out in open domain. But let me look at one that, that you know, it's just topical because it's in the, the Middle East at the moment. Um, notwithstanding overwhelming conventional superiority by Western forces and some others um, in the region, Iran continues uh, day by day um, to use proxies to achieve its effect across the region. Um, ergo, um, the conventional posture is not um, an element of effective deterrence if you wish to change your behavior. So um, if you want to do that, um, what do you need to do to change the behavior of that country, um, as an example? And that's not so much you know, in my space, it's just something that I actually read from um, open media and sources out there as to you know, how they are um, operating. So that would be one example. Another example is um, to take um, elements of modernization, and I'll, I'll give you a couple of funny vignettes here too. Take modernization of uh, Russian forces. Um, Russia does a, a masterful job on the information domain of trumpeting all of their capabilities as being, you know, uh, front line. But we know uh, many of the capabilities are not. Um, uh, rolling out new formations and commands, uh, bringing back, uh, you know, tank armies. There aren't tank armies, and and so, but yet they get played in the Western media in ways that um, actually aid, um, you know, Russian uh, purposes, and so um, that that's that's an element. There is uh, one example. I remember sitting with colleagues about um, Kuznetsov when it was um, sailing through um, European waters, and it was f listing to one side a little bit belching out a lot of smoke and um, and uh, a great deal of uh, concern was expressed over that ship. Um, it had a, a, a seagoing tug right behind it with reason and um, and there might have been another approach for us to optimize to say it's not that's not necessarily the threat that you think it is to us um, and yet we could focus on other domains and areas where they have built their forces to where um, it um, um, is a threat to us and which we haven't properly um, tackled. As an example, um, we need to have a much more um, engaging presence in the media to say, you know, this just isn't a problem, folks. You know, um, that's not where we need to be concerned about. Um, we need to be more concerned about X, Y, and Z, not A, B, and, and C. Um, does that give a little bit there, um, Steve? Um, I'd be happy to tease something else out, but um, uh, circle back on your question for me if you want. Uh, what are our greatest vulnerabilities that others see towards us who think we're strong in certain areas and we can others? So, um, I, 
I, I think we have this impression that we're good at whole of government, and I don't think we are. Um, I, I, I truly believe that. I, I think uh, I can't speak for allies, but I see the same uh, problems being played out. Um, I think we're very good at the tactical level. Um, and what the irony is, is when General Hethington came to see me um, um, in Kandahar, you know, we had government departments that were working very well together on the ground. Um, because the adversarial environment had a wondrous unifying effect of, uh, of unity of thought, purpose, and action, right? The fact somebody's trying to kill you. Um, but operationally, take a step back, maybe not so much, and strategically, uh, certainly not. And whole government is built uh, from the top down. It can't be built from the bottom up. You can have successes over time by leaders used to working to one another that when they move on to subsequent appointment work better with one another. But it has to be built with a deliberate um, intent. Um, Russian strategic military doctrine is outlined in Covington and, and others um, uh, effectively points out how they can bring all elements of their power together. We misunderstand the pads when they conduct those exercises. Uh, we look at them um, 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 not the way that um, the Russians are actually looking at them. And so we need to, you know, take stock of that. And that's an example. They have an ability to bring forces from all across Russia and project out in very short notice. Um, and whether we like to admit it or not, they have that um, ability across all of their departments. And yes, it is a state that is structured in a way that we would not want to be structured. I get that. Um, but for us, on a whole of government context, um, it, we are set up um, in a governance model that's circa 1867. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's adapted to the reality of modern conflict in a way that I talked about that light switch uh, effect. So whole of government operations really need to have, um, in, in a security sense, um, a greater um, um, a greater effort at uh, a strategic level leadership. It's not the fault of any one organization. I think that you know we're as much um, uh, of the challenge space as anybody else. It's overcoming cultures and the way that we're used to operating because we haven't come to terms with what has changed in the in the adversarial space. Um, and that's happening. It's just it's happening. The change is coming. That's the good news. But it's just coming a little bit more slowly than than probably we would like to see happen. I think. I'm being very candid at Mark. I, I, I'm, I'm kind of hoping that uh, that's not going to end up in Twitter storm there right now. But, uh, but I think from academic purposes, um, I think that that's a valued contribution. If you think from that perspective, that every day we go together in uniform, we need to be thinking about how we can work better with a partner from another government department to represent Canadians. I mean, that's the essential point that I bring to the table. Yeah. Um, I just want to pick up on an analogy that you used about the game of chess that's happening in Eastern Europe, because I think, I think that, that's fascinating. But what's the game being played here? Is the intent to achieve checkmate and topple the king from the other side? Or is it to just put two forces in stalemate and hope that nobody even attempts to find a route through that pawn chain? Um. I think Russia knows that it has uh, a tremendous strategic weakness over time. Um, that, um, you know, I just play on the comments of a colleague, uh, Lieutenant General Ben Hodges, you know, former commander of USER. Uh, time's not on Russia's side. And Russia knows it can't compete with the West if it tries to compete on the terms with the West as, as we understand it. Um, and so it seeks um, to sow discord and to drag down the West. Now we have a, you know, we were talking about Latvia. Um, to me, um, that's the near fight, the close fight. The, the deep fight is fracturing the European Union and European cohesion. And uh, we have seen that played out. And I'm not reflecting anything that is new or brilliant in, the, in my own, uh, you know, I'm, I'm relaying what we all see in the media. There's reasons why um, they have, you know, uh, funded political parties from both sides of the spectrum in the same country. And so as we begin to play that out, that to me is uh, the game. It's to, to, to break down their power, their relative power increases as the West decreases. So it doesn't necessarily come with the building of Russian power. It can come with the decrease of Western power, uh, as an example, and weakening society. And we can question the motivations. I'm by no means an expert. But everything that we see playing out um, you know, would suggest that that's um, part of the game, um, to be able to control the near abroad. The one thing I talk about, the chess analogy that I think is bringing out, as we 
I have from time to time been given briefings or I'll be sitting with colleagues and we were talking about a problem space and um, my question is, okay, that's great, now let's take stock, but what's happening over here? Um, the point is, is that we can't be linear. We can't just look at one part of a, of a nation that has uh, 13 or 14 countries that border it um, and then look at it and say that we have the ability, uh, the assumption of isolation. So if something's happening here, what's happening over there? It's If it's happening in this domain, what's happening in another domain? And that's how we need to be thinking um, uh, to understand the problem. Uh, I'd like to get your thoughts on uh, our operationalization or institutionalization of uh, influence activities, information operations, and then cyber as it's now in its infancy. Uh, so the easier scene, I, I believe universally, is very strategic capabilities that are um, combat multipliers that are going to be, and, and we see the Russians and, and other adversaries uh, using these to, to great effect. Uh, how uh, it, it is our uh, resourcing or a focus on these uh, areas going to increase over time, uh, or uh, are, uh, in many cases there's still secondary duties and our main focus is actually on building up the, the more conventional uh, capabilities and uh, influence activities and cyber seem to be kind of being built off to the side rather than a, an area of focus. No, th <clears throat> thanks for that, a great question. Um, and I'm not going to try to evade it. It's uh, CJOC, um, we force employ, um, and so I see the space as it is now. Um, the force development r rests with uh, uh, the service commanders, um, and so I'm actually not tracking it as closely. Um, what I can tell you, though, that I would bin it in the category of enablers that uh, strong and secure engaged as a policy framework uh, privileges two things. It privileges the concept of people first, mission always, which means that we need to really um, um, focus on uh, setting up through policy um, and other measures um, the kind of professional military that we want to have uh, to be successful in operations in future years. That's one theme. The second one is to rebuild um, enabler capabilities, intelligence surveillance, or reconnaissance, but all of that that falls into our special forces and the like that falls into those that are not um, the typical to the domain of, of, of the three services. Um, and I would argue that um, some of that capability will also be championed by a service. And in the case of, uh, you know, influence activities, uh, per se, the Army has a large uh, role in that. There's no doubt that we are going to do more over, over time. Um, and it's all about uh, sequence. And I think it's simply that we have to. Any future operation is going to have um, what we perceive as enablers as its core. And a former Army commander um, a few years ago pointed out to the Army that said, you know, future operations could be enabler-led, that the conventional forces are there to support um, the enabling capability that is actually delivering the main effect for the mission back to the government of Canada. And so when we look at influence activities, I would simply say that uh, we have not done uh, well at harnessing um, um, Canadian society um, and to what it can bring to bear through elements like uh, the reserve part-timers uh, that come out on a full-time status. Um, and that's part and parcel of making it easier for people to be part of the solution um, and part of the military team um, going forward. That, that much I do know. Uh, where it stands in terms of being resourced over time, I'm not tracking at all. Um, I get a get out of jail card on those kinds of conversations. And uh, in fact, most of the time, I'm not even at those meetings. Sir, you talked about the fungibility of power and the need for diverse uh, capabilities. When I look at that problem space, the first thing I look at is procurement and the endless issue with procurement. If you're actually looking at capabilities that require uh, small sector companies, academia, diverse groups, and you look at how do you acquire and develop that new capability and translate it into effective practice, the first issue is procurement and we seem stalled and unable to solve that problem set. Wow, thank you for that. Um, let me take a step back, uh, and I won't address the issue of, of uh, the challenges in Canada because the challenges that we have now were years in the making and go back through multiple administrations. The, the approach that we have now is a direct result of decisions that were taken 5, 10, and even longer years ago. 
Um, and so uh, I would say, though, just as a, a shout out to um, uh, retired Admiral Pat Finn and ADM Material, um, um, that um, some great strides have been made over the last year. I, I, I can see that just since my time as, as Chief Force Development. What I would say, though, is that we are still coming to terms with another trend where um, the, the kind of procurement processes that we have in place in Western democracies in the U.S. system and other allies are no less cumbersome than ours. I mean, they all have their challenges. But there are two main categories towards procurement going forward. There's the standard procurement um, that for a military based on capabilities does its assessment and says this is what we need. The other one is conflict-driven force development. And that's what I see. And my role in that is to write the statements of operational capability deficiencies um, and the urgent operational requirements we need to be successful in operations. And those will, by necessity, increase in number over time. And, um, and more and more procurement will fall within that. Maybe not on total dollar value, because you just can't get around the huge sums of money that are devoted to large capital expenditures. But many of the other kinds of things you're talking about for the smaller technological firms will fall into those categories as we need and we understand um, that even modern electronic systems aboard major capital programs that we have moving through need to have the ability to be updated not at that sort of half-life, but maybe the quarter life or maybe even small, shorter timelines going, going forward. And so that'll have to be built into those programs. Um, the, the other part it speaks to that will, is always a challenge in our democracies is back in, I want to say 2012, 50% of the uh, contracts in the United States Navy and United States Air Force were sole sourced. There were only, country, there were only companies that um, uh, a handful of companies that could deliver what they needed and they ended up being sole sourced. That's a reality and it's a, it's a policy issue that uh, people are dealing with. But when you're looking at conflict driven, um, it means adapting to have an ability to adapt more rapidly to what your adversaries are doing on the international stage. Um, and that's where I think uh, a great deal more effort is going to be placed, not just in our country, but in other countries going forward, is how we make that cycle faster um, so that we have the capability to be able to do operations. And that applies not just to us, that will apply to other security services as well for the kind of things they need to be doing across um, from law enforcement um, to partners um, in, um, in the communications realm.